Open Repositories 2012. I'm Kevin Ashley. I'm now going to hand over to John Howard, the chair of the Open Repository Steering Committee, uh, for a few words of introduction. Well, thank you, Kevin. Welcome to Open Repositories 2012, everyone, and welcome to uh, Edinburgh. Um, I'm John Howard. I chair the Open Repositories Steering Committee, and I'll be saying just a few words um, to orient you, especially you first-time attendees, to Open Repositories and um, to make a few words of acknowledgement that are important to make. Uh, there are a lot of familiar faces here, so I know that uh, there are lots of people who've been to open repositories previously. If you haven't been, uh, you would have seen the statement that is projected here to describe it. But I think in fewer words you could say that open repositories is a conference for and by people who are at the front lines of making open digital repositories work. It's for the developers, the repository managers, digital content specialists, the administrators who find resources to sponsor them, and everyone else who's involved in this expanding ecosystem of digital repository services. <coughs> open repositories is intended to be a learning opportunity. It's a networking opportunity. It's a time to exchange ideas, and having stepped out of our day-to-day -day responsibilities for a little bit to gain new knowledge, to new ideas, and to make some new professional friends. Now, Open Repositories is in its seventh year. It's great to be here in Edinburgh. Uh, I'd just like to draw your attention briefly to the next two year's conferences. You'll hear more about next year's conference at Prince Edward Island, Canada at the next plenary. Uh, so be ready for that and mark your calendars for June 2014 when the conference will take place in Helsinki, Finland. Now, OR was started by people much like yourselves, people who work with open digital repositories, who identified a need for building community and for exchanging ideas on an international scale. In the background is the Open Repository Steering Committee, Steering Committee selects sites, works with the program chair, the local organizing groups, and the user group chairs to make OR happen from year to year. So I'd like to acknowledge the members of the current OR steering group, who are Tom Kramer, Richard Green, Wolfram Horstmann, Holly Mercer, Carol Minton Morris, and special thanks to Car Carol, who uh, played a special role this year as unofficial deputy chair. Thank you, Carol. Jonathan Marco, William Nixon, Peter Sefton, Sarah Shreves, and Ellen Stangeland. Steering committee itself morphs during the course of the year, inviting other individuals who are key to the conference to join in fortnightly calls as the conference planning unfolds. The first to join are the chairs of the local organizing group. When the steering committee selects a program chair, they join as well. This year, the individuals doing the local organizing are co-chairs Stuart McDonald and William Nixon. Program chairs Kevin Ashley. Thank you very much for the extraordinary work you've done so far to pull this year's conference together. We've also invited the user group chairs to join the steering committee calls this year to just help better coordinate things. So here, special thanks go to those uh, user group chairs, John Dunn, Robin Rice, and again, William Nixon. So thank you. Now, the uh, steering committee members rarely retire from the committee. This more or less fades silently into the background and step forward uh, whenever they're needed. And uh, so acknowledgement to them as well. And you can see their names listed on the slide. So one thing we think about, of course, is keeping open repositories going from year to year, and how can you keep up with that yourselves. We do maintain a Google group, and I encourage you very much to subscribe. Um, the address is there, but in fact, the easier way to remember that address is to also follow OR Conference on Twitter. So at OR Conference is a new Twitter account. It's intended simply to keep you abreast of the year-to-year conference planning and key dates that you'd want to be mindful of in that. You're not going to get spammed from either direction 
And you'll find the Google Groups address on the profile for the Twitter site uh, yourself. So tweet it now so that the word starts getting out. You'll also, when you visit the profile, there's a very sad default Twitter image there. Now, Open Repositories has never even talked about having a logo. But if you'd like to uh, get your creative juices flowing, come up with something. The steering committee would like to see your, your efforts, and uh, we will replace that default image with what's contributed. So thank you very much. Um, I hope you all enjoy Open Repositories. And uh, at this moment, I'll just turn things back to the program chair, Kevin Ashley. Thanks very much, John. So I'm Kevin Ashley. I'm director of the Digital Curation Center. And along with my colleagues uh, at Adena uh, and at the Edinburgh University Library, I'd like to say welcome uh, to, to Edinburgh. We're really pleased that this year's Open Repository. We think we've got more attendees more presentations, more sponsorship, and more sunshine than at any <laughs> previous Open Repositories conference. One of those statements may be untrue. I'll leave it up to you to detect where, which of those it is. So just to say a little about what's different about our, our this year than, than, than other years, one of the things we've tried to bring to this is a flavor of the repository fringe, an event that, that's unique to Edinburgh. You'll see that's one of the third tracks uh, in, in your programs, and we current, encourage you to, to join in with the more experimental and unconference flavor of what will be happening in that, as well as the parts of OMAR that regular attendees will be used to with the plenaries that are happening at the beginning at the end and, and the papers that will be taking place over the next couple of days. We'd also uh, encourage you uh, to, to put in our ideas to the developer challenge. You can do that until 4 p.m. today. Whether or not you're a developer, they're looking for ideas from, from anyone, whether or not you're able to actually turn them uh, into to code. You can enter uh, via the blog, which you can reach at bit.ly slash devcsi. Um, so do that by the end of coffee break today, uh, otherwise you won't get the chance to do that. You'll have, if you get an entry in there, you'll get the chance to do a brief pitch tomorrow at the developer show, and there's a chance uh, to win valuable prizes uh, of up to a thousand pounds, and extra prizes for anyone who can sneak in a bit of Microsoft technology to their, to their answer. So I'm not gonna say much more about the structure of the conference. You've all got programs in your packs. There's the website, which is packed uh, with information, both about the conference and about Edinburgh uh, itself. I want to hand over now uh, to our first, uh, keynote speaker, Cameron Nalen. Cameron, we're really pleased to have here. He's been uh, both an advocate and a practitioner of open research uh, in every way for a number of years, an example to many of us, and someone who doesn't just advocate the ideas of open research, but gives time to thinking about what works and what doesn't to help the rest of us uh, in, in improve what we want to do. Cameron, just this week, uh, has taken up a, a new job as Director of Advocacy, I think that's right, at the Public Library of Science. We're really pleased that we got the op opportunity uh, to give him the first speaking opportunity uh, in that new post. So thanks very much and welcome, Cameron. So, so thank you very much for the introduction and for the opportunity to speak. Um, I can't tell you how much of a relief it is to be doing one of these talks and not wondering whether I should have told my line manager that I was coming or not. <laughs> Um, but I want to talk in general terms about um, network-enabled research, what networks mean for research. And I want to do that at really quite an abstract level. Um, so this is going to be right up at 60,000 foot level, um, but I hope it provides a way for you to think about how to apply what we've learnt about networks, about digital repositories, and about the way research functions in practice and supports outcomes along the way. Um, I'm going to start with a slide that I always start with. Um, feel free to take notes, tweet, otherwise pictures, whatever. I don't care. If you have a really good idea and make lots of money out of it, you know, sub me a little consultancy along the way, but, but, but um, essentially feel free to use what I am providing in whatever way is, is useful to you. So what is the challenge? 
that we face in the context of research communication, in the context of making research effective um, for the people who fund it. The challenge, I think, for many of us, certainly many researchers, is that we've got this incredible level of frustration, of feeling overwhelmed, of feeling unable to deal with the demands of funders, of institutions, of our research community, and of the sheer amount of information that's coming flooding down on top of us that we're supposed to somehow pass out and do something useful with. There's an awful lot of this kind of thing going on. I leave it as an exercise to the audience to decide whether it's a repository manager on the left-hand side and the researcher on the right, or vice versa, or a funder and institution. But often it sometimes feels like we're doing more, more shouting at each other than actually speaking to each other, and certainly more broadcasting than understanding of issues. And there's a real sense that there's something missing. The real sense that we have this new set of toys that have this enormous potential to build something new, but somehow we're not exploiting them effectively. That in terms of delivering what we can create and convert from the money that we receive, the infrastructure that's provided, into research outputs and research outcomes, that there's something missing in this delivery pipeline that somehow we're not getting from where we are to where we should be. So the way I want to construct this, this talk is really around a 3 two, one kind of pattern. So I would argue that there are three areas where we need to deliver in terms of infrastructure provision and the things that we're providing. I want to wrap that up in two fairly significant conceptual changes around the way we communicate research effectively and how we manage the information flow. And I want to try and pull that all together with one central principle, which for me is the useful way I find to bring all of these issues and thoughts together. But let's start with, with where I'm coming from and what my background is in, in, in approaching this. So as Kevin said, I now work for the Public Library of Science, which is an open access publisher, and I've been involved in open access advocacy for six or seven years now. I've also been involved in a lot of the efforts around open data more generally, um, open process, open things, open research in, in very general terms. So you might expect that the way I'm going to approach this is a kind of hippie, wouldn't it be nice if if everyone just played nicely and we all just got along kind of argument. I could make that argument, and there's a good public good argument, and those are, are perfectly valid arguments to make about the conduct of research, but that's not really the environment we find ourselves in today, either globally or, or in the UK. We're expected to provide a bit more hard-nosed and a bit more pragmatic arguments around how we approach these kinds of problems. So I want to take the tie-wearing approach. Um, in fact, I want to make a business case around how we tackle this. Again, so what is it that we have to deliver as a business, as a service provider, for the people who fund, for the most part, either directly or indirectly, our salaries and our work? So I want to talk about questions of quality of service, because we don't want to change things and end up in a system which doesn't work. We need very much to be concerned about value for money. And at the same time, we don't want to create systems that are going to collapse in five years. So we need to worry about sustainability, both in economic terms, in cultural terms, and in infrastructure terms. But if we're going to talk about a business case, and we're going to shape it around sort of business-oriented concerns, then who are we? serving. In particular, who is the customer? Who is buying our services? Who are we providing them to? Who are we marketing to? So you might think that it's kind of these folks, or if you're from across the pond, these folks, or maybe in a European context, the, the Commission. But they're just the people who funnel the money through to us in practice. Yes, it's important to make arguments to government, but actually it's much more important to serve these people, the taxpayers, the ones who are actually 
provide the money that lets us do what we want to do. And that wider taxpaying public, which includes us, don't forget, we have a stake in this process as well, is actually remarkably sophisticated about the value of research and the amount of time it takes to deliver. There is not the expectation that we will have results tomorrow. And there is an appreciation of the value of research that doesn't necessarily deliver economic or practical outcomes, but does something exciting. We had an example of that with the use of Comic Sans by a certain group in Switzerland last week, which while it was the fact that Comic Sans probably got more coverage than the discovery of the Higgs boson, nonetheless, it was the case that that got global coverage and excited a lot of people around science that might not have otherwise been covered. So the customer is the global public and the product we are providing to our customers is research outcomes, not outputs. The public doesn't give a damn about the production of research papers or of research data sets. They want to know about how these things have an impact on their lives. So we have to move beyond talking about outputs and start to think about how we effectively translate those into the outcomes that matter to people. Okay, so that's where I'm coming from. Why are we having this conversation? Why is this kind of discussion of how we do things coming up so often? And, and in particular, why is it happening now? Why didn't it happen 20, 30, 40 years ago? And you guys know the answer to that. The answer is that we're currently going through the biggest change in communications technology and network technology, certainly since the invention of the printing press, some would argue since the invention of writing. That the kinds of networks that are provided by the internet and the web and our ability to move things around has changed so radically that we are in a completely different space from where we were in the print world of 20 years ago. And the reason for that is that networks actually qualitatively change our capacity to do things. We tend to think of networks, of communications technology as being something that makes what we do better or faster or more efficient. But actually the centre of my argument is that there is a qualitative change in what we can do. Most of you are young enough, I think, to remember the world before mobile phones. 15 years ago, if I'd showed up in Edinburgh and said, oh, I fancy meeting up with some people, having a drink, it would not have been possible. Those of you who are slightly older can remember the world before email. That time when there just was one or two of you who actually had this really cool thing that you could send notes to each other, and that was kind of useful. But it didn't really help all that much because most people didn't have it. And what happens when you start with a set of nodes of people, of resources, on a graph, and you start to connect them up via some sort of network infrastructure, what happens is the connectivity doesn't change very much for a long time. All you do is make it slightly easier for a small number of people, email users, people with mobile phones, to communicate with each other in the way they are already used to doing. Nothing much changes until this point when suddenly you can rely on pretty much everyone having an email account, on pretty much everyone having a mobile phone. What happens is that you go from a network where there is a small number of people better connected, more effectively communicating, to a network where the entire space is traversed. And for those of you with a chemical or physical background, this is in fact a phase transition. This is a cooperative phase transition where a network, the possibilities of communication crystallize out from what was previously a solution. There is a qualitative change in the nature of the system. But what does that mean in practice? That's, that's a very abstract kind of concept. So I want to give an example. I'm going to give a couple of concrete examples, and I'm going to pick some fairly old ones, actually, because I think they're, they're, they're nice examples and they're, they're illustrative. 
but they also use now what is now relatively old technology. So January 2009, Tim Gowers writes a blog post. Now, Tim, now Sir Tim Gowers, as of a couple of weeks ago, is one of the world's greatest living mathematicians. He also happens to blog, and he's interested in improving the way that mathematics is done. So he wanted to ask this question. Could you do maths in a different way, rather than a single person sitting at their desk with a piece of paper? Could maths, in fact, be collaborative in the way that he saw a lot of experimental sciences were? And so to do that, he posed an experiment, and he posed a particular problem, a particular mathematical problem, which he thought was actually quite hard. And then being a good academic, and thinking carefully about how you report what your goals are to your funders, he immediately cavilled about how far this experiment was going to go. And he says, it is not the case that the aim of the project is to actually solve the problem. But what he proposed was that he had a thought about a solution that might work, and so the idea of this project was to involve as many people as possible in the question of whether his proposed method was a good way to solve this particular, quite difficult, mathematical problem. But even there, he believes that the chances of that are substantially less than 100%. Like I say, always write your grants so that failure is a good result. <laughs> Six weeks later, he decides this problem has been solved. Bear in mind that this is a problem that he said it would have taken him nine to 12 months just to work through his proposed methodology. In fact, not just has the problem been solved, a more general and more difficult case of the problem has been solved, and it was not solved in the way that Tim originally proposed. What happened was that several hundred mathematicians discussing small pieces of mathematics in the comments of a WordPress blog were capable of solving a mathematical problem that one of the world's greatest mathematicians regarded as too hard. And they did it in about a month and a half. Tim writes that he felt that this was as like to normal research as driving is to pushing a car. The sudden realization that these keys, these things you have in your hand, go in the ignition. And something happens, and you can go places and do things that were simply not possible before. This is a qualitative change in research capacity mediated through a pretty ropey network system, a blog in which a large number of mathematicians can come together and leave comments and converse and discuss. Let me give you another example. Again, this is one that might well be familiar, but I want to take it from a slightly different angle. So Galaxy Zoo is a web service. It's one of the poster children for citizen science, um, where a large number of people have become involved in classifying galaxies. And this was an open invitation and a web service and a, and a fun game that people could be involved with. But I want to talk about the motivation behind this. So the problem was that galactic science is largely driven by posting, posing a model and then looking for the kinds of galaxies that exist, the distribution of their shapes and sizes and where they are, and seeing whether that matches up to the model as proposed. That means you need to look at pictures of galaxies and classify them into different shapes, sizes, these kinds of things. That's a kind of pretty specialist job. So your professional researcher, in amongst all the other things they can do, can maybe do find time to do 100 of these a week. That's a bit of a problem, because to get the kind of statistical power that's expected, or at least that was expected, to get you into publication, you need to classify about 10,000, which is significantly more than 100. That's OK, because we have these automated robotic systems, we call them graduate students, <laughs> who can solve this problem for us in a parallel fashion, um, fed mainly by beer and peanuts. This is a particular PhD student who was the hero of this particular area of science. Over the course of his PhD, he did 50,000 classifications, and having handed in his thesis and closing the covers, said, I am never going to classify another damn galaxy again. <laughs> 
But there was a problem, and the problem was that even when taking 10,000 galaxies, different people were asking the same question of subtly different data sets and giving, getting different results. They were sampling very large numbers of galaxies, looking at the statistical distribution of shapes and sizes, and coming up with different answers, usually the one that supported their own theory for some reason, but yeah, that's just the way these things work. The problem and the opportunity was that, and this is now some time ago, the data source that most of them were using was the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, an, an open data source of images of galaxies, and there were a million in that data set, completely beyond the capacity of any research group, indeed of the entire research community, to classify at scale. And computer algorithms do not do a good job of this classification. They still don't some years later. What did they do? Well, they took a data resource, resources, images of galaxies. They distributed that through a website to other resources, members of the public who were interested in this problem and could contribute and could solve this specific problem, and then provided an easy mechanism for those people to contribute those resources and their analysis back into a central database. Those million galaxies were classified five times over by 300,000 people in two months. Changed the capacity of that community and the expectations of that community around what research means. What the expectations of getting published, of drawing statistical conclusions were. Again, qualitatively different. And the things that link these two stories together are an increase in the scale of resources that can be brought to bear on a problem, going from one mathematician to 150, going from a couple of PhD students to 300,000 members of the public. Connectivity, the ability to move resources, to move data, to move information and conclusions through a network provided essentially by the web. And critically, the efficient transfer of information. The web enables the Galaxy Zoo folks to push images to very many people. They also had to build a really good website that made it easy for people to push information back. The data they pushed back wasn't big data. It wasn't large amounts of information. But it had to come back efficiently, and it had to be easy for them to do. So the question as service providers, as the people who are delivering a product to our customers, has to be, how do we get some of that? Where can we apply this kind of thinking, this kind of capacity, this kind of infrastructure to research problems so that we can solve the problems that face us today, so that we can change the research capacity we have to enable us to solve the really quite serious problems that face us today? And again, as service providers, how do we deliver networks that are the right shape, the right size, the right connectivity, in the right place for the right problems? So again, we can draw some lessons from those stories and from others around what the shape of this infrastructure, this support, these networks look like. We need to deliver scale, and web scale, Millions of connections, billions of nodes, connections to the entire public and to the entire research community, and connectivity between them. We need to enable the very low friction transfer of resources from one place to another, from the point where they're created to where they can be analysed, from the point where they're analysed to the point where someone can use them to do something. And we also need to change our thinking around the way we filter information and the way we make it available. So the first two of those are really quite easy. We have the web. We have the biggest network we've ever had, with very easy transfer of digital objects, at least, from one place to another. And even for physical objects, as long as we put the metadata about them online, then FedEx isn't too bad. But we have a problem. We have a cultural background where our approach to handling research, communicating research, delivering research is controlling access. It's having power over those who use it, power over those who can see it, 
and power over those who might make money from it. And if that's your approach to research, then you're selling a product that no one wants because you're selling a product that does not exploit the capacity of the network fully to ensure that we deliver return on investment for the public expenditure on research. So how do we think about that? How do we change the way we go about it? And what does that really mean in practice with what we can do? Again, I want to use an example, or I want to talk about the way this publication can help inform us in our way of thinking about how we need to reconfigure the way we do things. So this is a paper published by Gunter Eisenbach about a month or so ago. It's quite a controversial paper. Um, there are lots of issues about methodology here. But the fundamental notion that by making more people aware of a paper, then more people are likely to use it, I think is one that is probably reasonably commonsensical. It's a point where we can start. And it kind of makes sense. So if you've got some folks down here who, can, who are reading and discovering that research output, and then you've got some folks, the yellow dots, up there, who are the people who can actually use that research and do something with it, then it makes sense that if you can find better ways to connect the blue dots and the people who connect to them, to the yellow dots and the people that connect to them, that if we can connect our research community up better, that you'll find more of those outcomes, right? That makes sense. It's also a very naive way of thinking about it. Because what you're missing is the 400 million people on Twitter who aren't practicing researchers. At the scale of the network, it doesn't matter that those people are less connected and less interested in research because there are 400 million of them. There will be someone who is likely to make that connection and connect those two networks together. In fact, there's likely to be more than one. At this scale, you manufacture serendipity. You have to think about the problem in a completely different way. And as those networks scale out and as you connect those people, then you can find entirely new uses that weren't imagined before, entirely new applications in interdisciplinary areas, or indeed, forget that, completely outside the traditional research enterprise that we can connect people who would otherwise not have a role in research up into that process and let them take part and interact with research. And at scale, there are probably more of them than there are traditional researchers. The problem is that as we start to remove access from some of those people, as we start to make it difficult for them to interact, as we start to make it difficult for them to discover that this research exists, that those connections disappear. They break. The network loses scale and it loses connectivity through such simple things as not being able to access the research, let alone not being able to search or discover it. And in a world where, as a researcher, it was very clear that our object is to optimise the impact of our research, those yellow dots are our value proposition. Those outcomes are the critical thing we're delivering. And each time we break a connection in the network, each time we take a node or a resource off that network, we lose potential outcomes and we stop delivering value. Reducing access in general terms just damages our product. OK, so where is the problem? I'm kind of I'm preaching to the choir here. You guys know that as we open up resources, as we make them available, that you get better research, more effective research, and greater outcomes. The problem lies in the fact that we've become obsessed culturally and economically in the research community with products and product thinking. It's as though we live in a world where when we go and get our car serviced, we take it 
to a garage, we give them the car and then rent it back. And so we end up in the situation that every time we want to do something new, something interesting, something unexpected, or let someone else use the car, the person who's doing the servicing, the garage, has the precise economic imperative to say, I'm sorry, that's not in the contract. No personal use only, sorry, no business use. No loaning of the car, no, no, certainly, certainly no um, renting the car out, because the whole system works such that they have to find new pieces of money, new ways of making money out of new kinds of opportunities. If we turn that on its head, if you pay for the service up front, either in kind or in actual cash, then the service provider's interests can be aligned with that of the researcher, of the funder, and of the people who need to use the research. If it's in the interests of the service provider to ensure that that research gets as widely used by as many unexpected people as possible, then everyone's interests start to align. So I've kept talking about this, I've kept using this term, but one of the key things is we do need to move to a sense of thinking about these things as services. Services that we value, services that we pay for. When we're talking about publications, we do need to talk about first copy costs. But we also need to put that in context. So Horton and Swan recent report on what the costs of lack of access mean to small and medium enterprise in Denmark. They've got this estimate of losing about 72 million euros a year. That's economic activity, direct economic activity lost because of small and medium enterprise that doesn't have access to research. So if you scale that by GDP, that's about 700 million pounds a year in the UK. Which kind of puts 40 or 50 million pounds possible transitional costs to an open access environment in perspective. And that's before we talk about savings to government, it's before we talk about potential subscription savings and all the other things, let alone what we could actually spend that money on to enabling research to be more effective. So I said there were three areas to deliver scale and connectivity of networks, low friction of transfer, and I wanted to emphasize that the way to think about that is to think about services that deliver those characteristics for customers. And then I talked about this third one, or rather I didn't talk about it, I punted on it for the moment, demand side filters. And this is wrapped up in these two conceptual changes. So the first change the need to scale networks to make things available, to make things accessible, is simply this model of product-oriented subscription access to research outputs is over. It is dead. To the extent there are still publishers out there operating on that model, they are shambling zombies that are starting to fall apart at the seams. But service industry of ensuring that people's content is made available, is marked up, is semantically valuable and can be found by the people who can use it, that's a great service business to be in. Whether you're providing that internally in an institution or externally as a provider. The second key conceptual change is one that's a little bit less comfortable, a little bit less familiar. And that's that we have to shift the way that we think about where we'd put the filtering into the system. So what do I mean by that? Well, let me, let me pin this down. Peer review is a filter, and it's a filter that we tend to value very highly as a research community. But filters block. In fact, that's what they're supposed to do. That's their job. But blocks are friction. A block to putting something on the web, to making a resource available, to connecting it up to other potential resources is a friction if you put it on the supply side. And we can argue about whether peer review as currently configured is a good model, whether it works or not, but that's actually not very important because whether it works or not, it can't always be the right filter and it certainly can't always be the right filter for everyone. The thing that you've decided not to put online, that you've blocked from publication today because you don't think the conclusions are supported by the data, 
is a thing that I need because I want the methodology. The thing that you throw out tomorrow because the methodology doesn't support the conclusions is the thing I need for the data. And the thing that's complete and utter garbage is the thing I need to build a better filter for myself so that I can find the things that I want. Google doesn't get better by taking pages off the web. It uses the pages that we don't want to see as a way to build their algorithms that help us discover the ones we do. When you block things on the supply side, you break connections, you lose the scale of the network, and you reduce your opportunities to generate impact. If we flip that and put it on the, on the demand side, then what we're doing is solving the problem of information overload. This is just a rephrasing of Clay Shirky's soundbite. We need filter filters that we control to deal with the problem of filter failure because I want control over what I see and when I see it and where I can find things. As a reader or a user, I want systems that will help me discover what I want, when I need it, and for what I need it in the context I'm in at that point in time. I ideally want systems that will actually tell me about things before I know about them. And actually, as far as I'm concerned, this is actually the biggest opportunity to take all of the outputs that we generate, including those that are not published, and to actually make them available in a way that advances research communication in a way that simply wasn't possible before. And this is what you guys do. You make stuff available and discoverable and help people connect to them. So what can you do in practice? Well, I think the first point, we kind of went through a thinking phase where repositories were about putting things in. And I think we got beyond that. We appreciate that it's also important that things come out again. So having stuff is good, making things accessible and usable is better, and we need to value and measure and report the usage and think about ensuring that the things that are in our repositories are in fact used. We need to optimise the discovery process so that people can come in and find those things. So in the framework I've talked about, what are the barriers that remain given where we are at the moment? And where is the friction in the system? Well, that's one. And I'm bored of it, to be frank. <laughs> Just sort it out. Just make a liberal open license the default. Somebody wants to choose some lame, non-commercial share like no derivatives license. All right, give them the option if you really want to, but just make it difficult and irritating for them. Make open the default. But I think more broadly, we still have a lot of broken connections in the system. We're getting better at putting resources into repositories, but are we good at connecting them up? Are we aggregating the citation graphs of objects that are in your repositories? Are they being interconnected across repositories and into the journal literature? What's the diversity of objects in your repositories? And how can they be better connected up? How can we solve the problem of blobs of Excel spreadsheets that might be useful if someone could only figure out what they are? How can we connect them into a wider graph, aggregations of systems that help people to find them? How can you support social discovery? How can you help people make connections and introduce other people to the resources you have? And how can you enable annotation from anyone into your systems? An annotation is a link between a person and a resource, between a concept and an object. But it's not going to come from your internal repository staff. It's probably not going to come from the researchers depositing the resources into your repository. Most of it's going to come from interactions that completely random people somewhere out there on the web are having with the resources you are providing. And the other big shift is to think about quality assurance. Badge it. Make it clear that something is good value, that it has high quality. Don't try and control it because it's just a waste of your time. Someone's going to shove it up on the web somewhere anyway. Most of the content we have is higher quality than what's on most of the web. So let's put it up there and then badge, 
certify the good stuff and make it more visible, more discoverable, so that people can find it. But if people want the direct, then they can go and find it. Saves you filtering it all out. So repositories have to be open. And they have to be open in the sense of being open for people to read and to access. But they also need to be embedded in this global network of links. They have to be open to the incoming annotations. And that's a real challenge. Outputs, the things that for most part we put in repositories, become outcomes, the things that we are judged and funded on, when the right user connects to that resource, when the person who can use it can find it and use it. And in many of these cases, creating a new connection could be more valuable than a new resource, which is a challenge to our thinking about how we prioritize collections development versus metadata collection, interaction analysis, analytics, and those kinds of things. When you're building up these networks. So again, to use networks effectively in our research community, in our research process, there are three areas we need to deliver. Scale and connectivity of the networks, friction, low friction to transfer, and effective demand side filters that involve all of this linking and page rank and all of those things that we're familiar with from the consumer web, but we're still yet to really exploit in the research space. There are these two key conceptual changes that are the challenges to how we think about the communication practice of research. Our old model of giving away our intellectual property to pay for the printing of it is dead. We have a model, we need to develop a model where we pay at some level and in some form, maybe through journals, maybe through the provision of repositories, to ensure that outputs are as available, discoverable, accessible, and usable as possible. And we need to think about enabling effective filtering for the user, which is dynamic, controllable, contextual, and ideally automated, agentified, so that I don't have to spend my time doing the searches, they're done for me. And for me, this was wrapped up in really one central principle, the central principle of figuring out how best to exploit the capacity and the infrastructure we have today, which is to think at the scale of networks, to assume there is an audience of hundreds of millions of people looking at your work or looking for your work, and to ask the question of how they might discover it to assume that the most likely use of your resources is something that no one has ever thought of before, because there are just so many people out there doing so many different things that you simply can't predict. And to think about how you decide to apply limited, let's admit it, resources to decisions around indexing, collections development, aggregation and technology development that actually engage with the fact that we're operating at a completely different scale and a completely different way to what we have done in the past. We can't build the system on the truths and the systems and the knowledge that existed even five or ten years ago. We could maintain a system on today's truths, but it wouldn't last very long. The only way we build for the future effectively is building with tomorrow's realities in mind by being out in front of what's happening, of seeing the direction of travel and being ahead of it. Innovators don't follow markets, they build them. And when we're delivering products as innovators, as service providers, for the global public, we need to be out much further ahead of the game than we are at the moment, preparing for what's coming down the road two or three years in the future. Because the network and its systems and its infrastructure and its capacity is our future. So we need to make sure we get it right. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Cameron, for a call to arms in lots of ways and I think and a, and a great example of what is um, right and wrong about the system. Do we have about a little over five minutes for questions for Cameron now? Does, uh... Okay. Brian. Not then. Brian. <laughs> Brian Kelly, Yukon. Great talk. Thanks, Cameron. You said about the need that we don't follow the markets, we build new markets. You talked about the importance of, of, of the net network effect. So it's kind of interesting at the moment. We've got Twitter, which scales globally, but we've got, we're seeing those issues about the control over the APIs. So should we be looking to develop an alternative looking to the future to three years time so that we've got the open Twitter? Or do we say, no, we've been down that route before. Twitter works. We need to continue using it. That's a really good question, and my so as as you know, many for many years I've been absolutely against any anything which was an X for science. It was first it was Facebook's for science. Today it's GitHub for science. Um, I've always been deeply against that because you know the best Facebook for science is Facebook, and the best GitHub for science is GitHub. Um, but that thinking did evolve in a world where the web was more open than it is today, and arguably. Um, more open than it appears to be becoming. Um, and so I think there is a concern. Um, I think there could, there could become a point where it would be worth our while um, building things that conform to our needs for openness, connectivity, um, that match onto the research community's needs. Um, I think we're still a long way away from that with respect to things like Twitter. But equally, we do definitely need to be keeping a watching eye on the potential for those things to become less useful than they are now. Um, but again, you know, Twitter has 400 million people on it still, 500, 600, whatever the number is today. Um, anything we build will have a lot less. Um, so it's going to be, it, ha it has to get a lot worse before it's worth shifting. Um, but equally, I think we should be arguing very strongly for it not to get worse. Thanks, that a brilliant talk. Thanks very much. Um, you've talked a lot about the systems and the technology. Of course, the web is a, is a socio-technical phenomenon, um, and it's full of human beings with agendas using technology to accomplish stuff. Um, I wonder, you know, sort of we, clearly we've seen that the web is a disruptive technology, and what we, I think what we need to see in this area are disruptive communities. Um, we've been very facilitating and supportive um, and not wanting to create too many ripples. How do we, uh, how do we create disruptive you know, academic communities that are really going to make a difference rather than be, you know, sort of playing it softly as we have been? So I think part of the answer is, is actually Yes, getting, getting in people's faces more. I think the, the opportunities to do that will happen. So for me, a large part of what will drive the shift is the, the way government is shifting to um, expecting people to monitor delivery of, of outcomes and, and, and usage of outputs and all these kinds of things. Um, so there's a pressure on researchers, at least, to start thinking about those things. Of course, for the most part as researchers, we don't know much about those things. We're used to our own way of doing things. Um, the place to be disruptive is, as always, at the point of maximum pain. Um, that point of maximum pain is certainly coming very soon for EPSRC-funded researchers in the data space. Um, it may well come very soon, um, depending on how Finch gets implemented. Um, for our UK funded researchers in general in terms of publication outputs. And I would say that the thing, again, is to be there, is to pick that point, pick that moment. You, you've got the technologies, you've got the capacity. Um, and yes, it's been very facilitative and very helpful, but at some point in the next six to 24 months, it's going to be, there's a pain point and getting in people's faces and actually saying, no, the time's up, you actually need to engage with this process and we will deliver ease of pain for you. Um, that's not going to be any easier than it has been. <laughs> um, but I think it is the, the time for 
sort of sitting back and facilitating what researchers think they want is probably past. I can say that now that I'm no longer actually a researcher, I guess. <laughs> Karen, hi. Great, great, great talk. Um, you talked a bit about removing the barriers to publication, getting research out there and then putting the filters on the supply, which I, I completely agree with. But I'm a little worried by the, the New World Journal model is to charge for access, right? And essentially, you don't, uh, you're talking about open repositories and that there are alternative routes to get the research out there. Absolutely, and that's a perfectly valid answer. But I'm thinking about the communities. This big network of connections are likely to go to these big places who can get, you know, market this and get the content that's going to build this big network. So how can the entire academic community, where there is the, low, the, the scientists who don't have the money to publish, potentially, and the, the scientists who do, how can we connect up this community to be one academic community rather than still have the serials crisis problem of, well, there's the valuable stuff here and then there's some other stuff sitting in some repositories and on some websites. So have you got any views on that? So there's, there's, there's two problems you described there, both of which, both of which are important. Um, the one of siloing, siloing results in r results, outputs, whatever they are in particular silos and then aggregating attention to them. Um, I think, from, from my perspective, is solved by proper licensing so that people are free to re-aggregate and bring things together in whatever forms they want. Because at the point where you have an interoperable commons of content and resources, then that people are free to use in those ways. And I think that problem hopefully goes away. There are still technical barriers and those kinds of things. Um, but where there's, to the extent that there will always be infrastructure at the centre, um, that re-aggregation, re-analysis, I think, can, can solve the siloing problem as long as the content is properly licensed. The other problem is obviously we don't want to exchange a problem with um, access to the outputs of research to, to the read, access on the read side to access on the right side. That, that's, that's clearly a problem. Um, I think there are two aspects to that. To that. You know, making stuff available, doing the markup, um, getting it into indexes, making it archived, making sure it's properly, you know, safe against failures. It costs money, and that money has to come from somewhere. I would argue it's an integral part of the research process. So anyone involved in funding research really does need to think about ensuring that the costs, that, that, that element of costs is built in. Um, and we do have to do a lot of thinking around how we manage the transitional process to support that. Um, I would hope that part of that will be bringing the costs of publication down in general terms. Um, one way to do that would be through shifting the peer review model. A lot of the expenses um, of open access journals are tied up in managing peer review. So if we, could if we could flip that model or find other ways of doing it, that would help to bring costs down. Won't get rid of them, but it'll bring costs down. I think we should also be exploring the possibility of contributions in kind. I'm not quite sure what that would mean in practice, but if we could move away from it just being about cash contributions, there might be some interesting models play there. And in the short term, um, those of us involved in, in the publication side have to take a principal position on those people who don't have access. PLOS has a no questions asked waiver policy. Um, you walk up. You submit a paper, it says in the box, the charge for this journal is this much, how much can you pay? Um, where you can put in zero, and there's, there's, there's no questions asked. BMC offers a, a waiver system which is slightly different, but nonetheless there's one there. It's a principled response to the situation at the moment in ensuring that particularly developing world authors um, can, can become involved, but it's not a long-term solution because it's just charity. Um, and I guess the other part of the answer to, the, to, the, to your question is that linkage between what is it, so a, a repository is just a publisher and a journal is just a repository. Some of those are paid for internally in institutions and some of those operate by different business models outside of institutions. And what's important is that we acknowledge these two are, are serving similar kinds of functions in different ways and at different times, but that where there's a cost differential, there has to be a demonstrated value for money. And at the end of the day, if authors don't feel that paying for open access journal publication charges is worth their while and they can put it in the repository and that does the job, then if that's the end game, then so be it. Um, 
and that will be an interesting thing to watch out for. I think what we shouldn't do is let people artificially restrict access to things because they don't believe they're offering value for money, which is what subscription publishers are doing by insisting on embargoes. So what they're saying is, actually we don't think that what we're offering compared to what could go into a repository actually offers value for money because otherwise we would be happy to compete with it. So the OA publishers are happy to compete with a final version in a repository. Um, and um, I hope that competition is something that keeps us honest on pricing. And just one final question then up at the back, and I think we'll have to then draw it to a close. So I, I th thanks for the, um, the call to arms about licensing, getting things out there. I think that works really well for publications because we have something that was probably Creative Commons borrowed from open source software or free software, uh, where if you own the copyright, you can put a license onto something, which is a great insight. Um, but I don't think it's that clear with data. Uh, depending on your jurisdiction, data sets, data collections may or may not be copyright. And you can't just say, there are all sorts of things that make it very complicated to say just license it. So yeah. what do we do about data? Um, well, I was, yes, I was in New Zealand last, last week where, of course, um, uh, my default answer, which is make it put it in the public domain, doesn't actually work because public domain uh, CC0 is incompatible with New Zealand copyright law. Um, I think it's difficult. We need to disentangle two things. Um, there's licensing as legal instruments. So we want to ensure interoperability. That's kind of the key thing, that when we make something available, we want to make sure that people can use it. And so that's the, that's the fundamental principle of making something as liberally licensed as it is possible to do, makes it as interoperable as you can. And there are going to be limitations on what you can do. Whether, you know, there are issues around waiving moral rights. There are issues around whether data is copyright. And there's obviously issues around who owns the copyright. Um, but the principle should be to try and make things as interoperable as possible. And I would still argue that you, know, you push for the most liberal license that is appropriate for the object um, that you can. Um, so adopting Victoria Stodden's work on um, an, an open research certificate, that would be BSD for code, um, CC BY for any creative work, writing and images, um, and CC0 for data where possible. But we're finding that's not entirely going to work. Um, so my current position is that I'm punting on this and hoping they sort it out in the Creative Commons version 4 licenses because the attribution license is supposed to, in that case, deal properly internationally with data, which would then solve the problem. And then we'd have the, in we'd have the interoperability sorted out, and we'd ensure that CC BY is interoperable with appropriate liberal software licenses. But there's another problem. And the other problem is that the other thing we use licenses for is social signaling. In fact, arguably, that's the primary thing people are doing when they attach licenses to things. They're not actually using them as a legal instrument. Um, because people tend to think that they're doing something about retaining control over particular uses, where of course they're not retaining control. They're giving that control to lawyers and judges. Um, but it's a, there's this social signaling element which has got tied up with the legal, the legal side of it. And I don't have a simple answer for how we deal with that. Um, I would hope that we can solve that in the long term by making these embedded assumptions around how people think about interoperability and transfer across networks and the ability to reuse things, that if that's the principle people think by, and if people are judged by how effectively their research is being used, then it's in their interests to make it as interoperable as possible, then we solve that social signaling problem by people just wanting to signal that they want their stuff used. I think that's, that's got to be the end game, that this, all of the signaling has to say, please use this for anything you want uh, in as many ways as you can, and I'd like to know about it. And that's hopefully where we get to. And that is what will enable the most efficient exploitation of, of our research outputs. OK, thanks very much. I think we're going to have to end the questions there uh, at, at that point. Cameron is going to be around for the rest of the day and this evening. You'll be able to catch him during the breaks and at the reception this evening. We'll also get the first chance to, uh, to, to see the, the posters. But I'm certainly going to have to be away tomorrow. Indeed, a new job uh, does require you to turn up in the office now and again. But thanks very much again. Thank <laughs> you.